This is David McKinster. We're going to be talking about skepticism. Uh, Bertrand Russell talks about the difference between appearance and reality and attempts to advance a reasonable skepticism in chapter one of the problems of philosophy. Um, skepticism is a term though that covers a broad range of views and we're going to talk a little bit about skepticism. Uh, we're going to talk about some views that Weston talked about when he talked about glib relativism, okay? And some of the views that Plato, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle found very uh, troubling, if you will, okay? Skepticism simply is any position that begins with doubt and demands reasons for believing, okay? Begins with doubt and demands reasons for believing. It's not the same as incredulity. Incredulity is a sort of an emotional attitude where you're just really reluctant to believe something. Okay, skepticism means that you have rational, you know, you have a rational demand that you want evidence before you believe. Okay, now there are different varieties of, of uh, skepticism that have been important in the history of philosophy. Methodological skepticism, just like it sounds, just like it looks like, the word method is there. It means you're using skepticism as a method for inquiry. Right? A philosopher, a scientist, any inquisitive person might begin an inquiry by saying, well, how do we know? Very oftentimes, uh, particularly if a, if, a, if a new philosophy teacher is not very good at, at getting this across, students who have never studied philosophy before will walk away saying, I have no idea what that man's talking about. He stood there the whole time asking us, is there a chair here? How do you know there's a chair here? I mean, is the guy nuts or something? Well, no. Basically, if, a, if an intro philosophy professor points to a chair and says, how do you know there's a chair here? It's very likely he doesn't doubt that there's a chair there. What he wants you to do is simply say, when I say, when I think I'm entitled to say I know something, here are the criteria by which I think I'm entitled to say I know it. I can see it. I can feel it. I can touch it. Other people can see it, feel it, and touch it. I can actually sit on it. And, uh, you know, okay, well, okay, now we're starting to generate a series of tests that we use in order to say that something is real or that some, you know, some proposition is, is, is true, okay? We can then use that as a model. How do I know the chair here is here? Okay, here are the things that would tell me that the chair is actually there. It's not a hallucination. How do I know that one plus one equals two? Well, okay, I can probably give a justification for that, but it wouldn't be the same set of criteria that I use to determine that the chair is there because it's an abstract proposition, right? Someone says something like, I know that abortion is immoral, or I know that God exists. One of the first things you would ask is, what do you mean by know? What is it you are claiming? Do you mean you have a really strong feeling? Do you mean that this proposition, this belief, makes you feel really good? Or that it retires a lot of nagging questions that you've had? Or what? What do you exactly mean when you say you know? And oftentimes that turns out to be, I don't know what I mean by no. <laughs> In which case, I'm just emphatically trying to tell you, this is it. Okay? One of the either most rewarding or most frustrating classes to teach is philosophy of religion. When things go well, you have people coming in and they are really ready to have a genuine dialogue about their most basic beliefs and their most basic values and this interesting stuff happens and it's, it's great. When it's frustrating, on the other hand, when it doesn't go well, basically early on in the semester you have the believers and the non-believers, you know, won't even sit together anymore. They're sitting on opposite sides of the room. It's like the parting of the Red Sea. Right? <laughs> They're sitting on opposite sides of the room and every, every discussion starts degenerating into, well, you can't prove it is. Well, you can't prove it isn't. Well, you can't prove it is. Well, you can't prove it isn't. I actually, one semester, a long time ago, I actually started taking a coach's whistle to class and when they'd start that, I would take it out and I'd blow it. And they'd jump out of their chairs, but they'd stop. I only had to do that a couple of times. Then after that, I would just reach for the whistle and they'd stop on their own. <laughs> um, but I, once I had stopped them, I would say, okay, here's a moratorium on saying you can't prove it is or you can't prove it isn't unless you are willing to give an account of what you would accept as a proof. If you're saying you can't prove God exists, but you don't have any idea of what it is you want the person to provide, what you would accept as proof, then you might as well just be sticking out your tongue and going, Pfft. 
On the other hand, if you're saying you can't prove God doesn't exist and you have no idea what you would accept as evidence that God doesn't exist, you're doing the same thing. All you're doing is sticking out your tongue and pouting. Okay? That's not dialogue. Okay? Starting with by asking, how do I know, means that you want to understand what concept of knowledge you are bringing to a situation when you think you are rationally justified in saying that you know something and when you are not. Okay? So as a method of investigation, skepticism has been very valuable in philosophy, in science, and just across the board in everyday life. Yeah, I might take this for granted, but do I really know this? How do I know this? And then once you start trying to explain how you know it, you might begin to say, you know what, I actually don't know this. <laughs> there are probably some pretty good reasons for doubting it. Limited skepticism is, if you will, a sort of conclusion that there are certain areas in which we can have knowledge and there are certain other areas in which we cannot have knowledge. We can only have opinion. Uh, you, one r typical reading of the divi Plato's divided line is that. In the lower part of the divided line, we only have opinion. Upper part of the divided line, we can finally actually have knowledge. Okay? <clears throat> Historically, in modern times, early, early part of the 20th century particularly, like up through the 1950s, there were many people who said, well, you know, the cat's out of the bag. Science gives us knowledge. Everything else is just opinion. Okay, that was a fairly naive view of what science does. And by the end of the 20th century, most scientists, at least on the cutting edge of science, would be saying, no, we deal with approximations, we deal with likelihoods, we deal with probabilities, we deal with models that are more or less well verified or have more or less explanatory power. That's not the same as saying that we have utter certainty. Okay? Um, so, you know, basically, you know, if you've in 19, say, 45, if you were talking to a, to a philosopher, the philosopher might very well say, well, you know, clearly, you know, we understand in modern times science gives us knowledge, but say in religion or ethics, we only have, uh, we only have opinion. Now, if you go back to medieval times, they would have been saying just exactly the opposite. Science is based on perception. Perception is, of course, as we know, fallible. The senses can trick us. We can, you know, we can make errors in our calculations. So, in fact, science only gives us opinion. Whereas in religion, we can have knowledge because we have infallible revelation as the basis for our, for our beliefs. Okay? See, it's not, like, it's not like limited skepticism is always one thing or another thing. Okay? What limited forms of skepticism have in common is that they say, we do in fact have knowledge in certain areas, but in other areas we can only have opinion. Okay? And that's a, a position for which one can argue for which one can present arguments and, and evidence and logic. It's not, a, it's, it's not claiming that we don't have any knowledge. It's claiming that, in fact, we do have knowledge. And by contrast with that model of knowledge, we would have to call other things opinion rather than knowledge. Now, radical skepticism, um, radical skepticism is radical in both senses of radical. First of all, fundamental, and second, extreme. <laughs> okay. Radical skepticism is usually expressed in either nihilism, which is basically I refuse to embrace and endorse anything, or solipsism, which says that nothing exists but my own mind, or, or a slightly weaker form of that, I can't know anything except my own mind. Okay? Radical skepticism is a position that philosophers have generally not taken. The, per, the uh, majority of philosophers have not taken at any point in history, for reasons we're about to look at. Um, the people who did oftentimes invoke radical skepticism early on were the sophists. It's a sort of an emergency exit from an argument, and you see this happen a number of times in the dialogues uh, Plato records of Socrates. Uh, a sophist says, oh, I know what virtue is. It's blah, 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 and Socrates dismantles that. Well, what I meant to say, it's blah, 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 and about the third or fourth time that Socrates has shown this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, he finally says, well, nobody knows anything after all. Who's to say? Nobody knows anything. It's like, well, five minutes ago, you were, you were perfectly willing to say you knew. <laughs> but this, oh, well, there is no knowledge, there is no truth, is an emergency exit to get out of the argument with at least not losing. It's like you realize you're going to be checkmated knocking over the chessboard and saying, oh, boy, was I clumsy or what. No, actually, you were trying to get out of losing. <laughs> um, so Socrates, Plato, and especially Aristotle. Aristotle gets very frosted about this, uh, writes about it a number of times. <clears throat> 
Aristotle, I'm going to define these more, you know, more explicitly a little later, but right now, let's look, take a look at how Aristotle treated this. Aristotle said, basically, <laughs> you know, if these people say anything at all, I've got them. And if they don't say anything, fine. I'm not going to argue with a plant. Okay? Um, book Gamma of Aristotle's Metaphysics, a wonderful piece of philosophical writing. Um, I'm going to refer to that a number of times while we're talking about metaphysics and epistemology. It sort of give us a baseline to work from. Um, lovely piece of writing. I think that a, a lot of what's in Book Gamma is very, very useful, although like most contemporary philosophers, I would say it may not be true in the sense that Aristotle thought it was true, but we'll get to that when we talk about theories of truth. Now, Aristotle has a reductio ad absurdum. By the time you see this film, you've already done the informal logic section, so you know what a reductio ad absurdum is. Basically, it's any argument strategy that shows if we assume this statement is true, we can show that it leads to absurd consequences, and that's a refutation of the original statement. Okay? So Aristotle says in Book Gamma, look, supposing someone says there is no truth, the first thing I would ask him is, is that true? What's he going to say? Yes, that's true. Oh, well, I guess then it's, you know, <laughs> there are truths, right? Well, okay, no, that can't be true because there are no truths. So it's not true that there is no truth? Look, either way, you're abandoning your position. If you say, yes, this is true, then there are truths. If you say, no, this is not true, well, okay, fine, it's not true that there are no truths. You've abandoned your position. You can neither assert nor deny this position without pulling the rug out from under yourself. That's Aristotle's point when he says, if they say anything at all, I've got them. Okay? Do you have reasons for holding this? Do you have anything that's supposed to be evidence for this? If so, you've only dug your hole deeper. Because if there's no truth, we can't have any good reasons, right? What do we have for reasons? Falsehoods? You have evidence? What do we have for evidence? Falsehoods? Or meaningless propositions? Well, no, and presumably you think you're presenting compelling reasons for holding there is no truth. Hey, come on, you can't have it both ways. Okay? Um, and as I say, this is not something that, I mean, that most philosophers have you know, given the time of day to. So, uh, the real only reason Aristotle writes about it is because it is such a, such a commonplace way of evading losing an argument among the sophists that he wants to sit down. Look, once and for all, you can't make that move. Okay? Um, yeah, you can't claim there, that it's true that there is no truth because you are contradicting yourself. And if you have any reasons, if you say you have any reasons or evidence for believing there is no truth, you've only further contradicted yourself. Okay? Well, supposing you say, well, the only truth is that there is no truth. Nice try. Right? As Wittgenstein says, if I can understand what you're saying, there have to be additional truths. Truths about language, truths about semantics. If you have any reasons for holding that, there have to be still additional truths. Can't make that move. Okay, well maybe, some radical skeptics would say, maybe what I really meant was that there are truths, but all truths are subjective. You know the difference between subjective and objective? Objective means it's true whether anybody knows about it or anybody believes it. It's just that's the way the world is. And subjective means it depends upon the mind of the perceiver. Um, presumably, there are parts in the engine of my car that I don't, I've never seen, and I don't know enough about car engines to know that they are there, but they're still there. If I took the car apart, I would find them. There are things in nature that, I, that have not been found yet. They're still there. We're going to discover them. We don't invent them when we find them. We discover them. Um, <clears throat> there are things that are purely subjective. If I have a pain in my eye, if I wasn't experiencing that pain, the pain wouldn't exist because that's a, pain is a subjective experience. The physical conditions causing the pain would still exist, but if I don't experience the pain, then I'm not in pain. If I have a dream, the dream exists because I had the dream. Okay? If I didn't have the dream, that dream wouldn't exist. So you've got objective and subjective on the one hand. Uh, the radical skeptic might want to be saying that all truth is subjective. In other words, 
There are no truths about the world. There isn't any way the world is. There's only what we think about the world. Okay, well, give credit where credit is due. First-rate thinkers always say, you know what, our models of how the world is are always imperfect. There's always more to be learned. There are always errors to be uncovered. There's always progress to be made. But this doesn't allow that to be possible. This says, in fact, there is no way the world is. There's only the stuff we say about it. Well, if we're making up, if we're making up the whole business, if this is all purely subjective, I think I'm going to start making up something different about, say, my mortality or my bank account or whatever. No, I'm, obviously I can't just make that stuff up. What I believe, if I believe there's money and I have money in the bank and I don't, that doesn't make me a bit richer. If I believe I'm going to live forever, that doesn't mean that, you know, if I get hit by a, by a tractor trailer, then I'm going to just say, well, yeah, but I didn't believe it. Okay, um, this belief is called solipsism. Okay, essentially the same reductio ad absurdum applies to it. You know, all truth is subjective, really. Is this only a subjective truth? Or are you saying this is the way the world is? Because if what you're saying is this is just what I believe, rather than this is the way the world is, then it's, you, you've trivialized it. You've essentially abandoned the position. It doesn't have any explanatory power. Okay? In popular culture, and particularly around the middle of the 20th century, this became very popular in popular culture, people like to say, well, what's true for me is true for me, and what's true for you is true for you. As many philosophers have pointed out, what does that even mean? Does it mean we have different beliefs about what's true? Yeah, so nothing revelatory about that. Does that mean I am incapable of having false beliefs? No, of course I'm capable of having false beliefs, and so are you. If we have different beliefs, that's the beginning of dialogue. That's the beginning of investigation about how the world actually is. Karl Marx once said, when, people's, when people sink into that kind of subjectivity, it's a sure sign of the corruption of society. People no longer have the heroism to try to address the world and engage the world and figure out the world and do something about the way the world is. Instead of that, they just sort of sink into their own thoughts. That's essentially saying, you know, my, my imaginary life and my, my imaginary playmates are all that's real for me. That's a serious problem if that's true. This kind of, this kind of belief that essentially all we can ever know is our own consciousness is called solipsism. Okay, solipsism is, you know, most philosophers would hold is an incoherent position. It literally does not make any sense upon analysis. Bertrand Russell once wrote a tongue-in-cheek article praising the self-consistency of solipsism. He was, he was making an arcane joke, but someone wrote to him and said, Dear Lord Russell, glad to see you are a solipsist. I've been a solipsist for years. It's nice to know there are two of us. Well, of course, the joke is, if solipsism is true, I have no reason to believe there are two of us. Only that there's just my own mind, my own consciousness, that's all I know. A, uh, an anthropologist who specialized in evolutionary biologist named Anthony uh, Bateson, Gregory Bateson, I'm sorry, Gregory Bateson, uh, wrote a book in the 1980s called Mind and Nature, A Necessary Unity. Uh, he died shortly after that was published, unfortunately. Uh, there's a posthumous collection of his shorter articles called Steps Toward an Ecology of Mind. And <clears throat> he pointed out, if solipsism is real, if all we know is our own consciousness, and our consciousness is not a window to the world, if it's a brick wall, if it's opaque, it's not a window to the world, we would have died out as a species a long time ago. Why would we develop consciousness? Consciousness allows us to live in the world. For it to fulfill its function, it has to actually be a window to the world. That doesn't mean it's a perfect window. It doesn't mean it has no tint. It doesn't mean that it is, allows us to see everything. But is it actually giving us information about the world? What other purpose does it have? <clears throat> yeah, a window, not a wall. Do I see the world through my consciousness, or do I, in fact, only see my consciousness? Well, if it's the latter, it would be impossible for us to even express that position as we're about, about to see in a moment. Um, <clears throat> I, had a, uh, I had an acquaintance when I was an undergraduate who was a drama student, and he, uh, 
decided for some reason to try taking a course from, uh, from our classics professor who was uh, kind of like a holy terror <laughs> to many people. A brilliant man, brilliant man, but if you were very opinionated and you couldn't back up your opinions, he would demolish you, and a lot less nicely than Socrates did. Okay. So this young man had spouted off in class about something, and the professor had just, you know, done his wrecking ball on the guy. Rather than feel a little humility about, about his opinions, uh, the student decided, I'm going to get him. The way I'm going to get him is I'm going to find some position that he doesn't like and can't refute. So the kid went to the library, probably the only time he was in the library during his undergraduate career. And remember, we didn't have Google in those days. And he started looking through the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, as the story goes, and he, until he got to the uh, article on solipsism and said, this is perfect. This is perfect. How could you possibly refute that? And I wish I had been there. I have to admit this is not a first-hand account, but I have this from two independent and very, very reliable sources, two people who do not tend to make up stories. The professor was sitting at his desk doing some kind of work, and the student barged in the door and flamboyantly said, you don't exist. The professor, without even looking up, said, get out. The student said, but I said, you don't exist. And the professor just kept working and said, get out. The student was indignant and said, I'm a student. You know, I have rights. I pay my tuition. You can't just throw me out of your office. And the professor, still without looking up, said, you can't have it both ways, young man. If I don't exist, I can't violate your rights. So the student left in a huff. And a while he came back, stuck his head in the door and said, well, you might exist. At that time, finally, the professor looked up and said, good, and continued with his work. Okay, well, how is that a refutation of, of solipsism? And basically, it, it, it emphasizes the point or illustrates the point that people who profess it generally have got some kind of agenda and they don't actually believe it themselves. They don't act like it's true. And in fact, it would undermine the rest of what they claim to believe. Wittgenstein asks the question, Wittgenstein is one of the most influential 20th century philosophers. Wittgenstein asks the question, does the solipsist knows what it, know what he's saying? If he does, he's wrong. We could not have a common language if solipsism were true. We could not have what Wittgenstein calls forms of life, the ways in which we live, the ways in which we interact, if the solipsists were correct. One reason for that is what is sometimes called lost contrast. Okay, certain pairs of terms only make sense in distinction to one another, in and out. How would you know what in is if you didn't know what out was? Okay, self and other. Remember the primal dyad in the divided line? <laughs> Identity and difference. How would you know what the one was if you couldn't contrast it with the other? Okay, well, subjective and objective are such a pair. If I didn't know what it was for something to exist objectively, I would have no contrast. I couldn't form the concept of being subjective. Okay? You can't have it both ways. You can't say we understand this distinction, but we have only ever had access to one side of it. In that case, we wouldn't know what the distinction was. Imagine a world in which there was no such thing as currency. Okay? Actually, we're kind of headed toward that at this point, very, very possibly. No such thing as currency. What would counterfeit money be? Well, that doesn't make any sense. There has to be authentic money for there to be counterfeit money. As Descartes pointed out, we'll talk about Descartes when we talk about induction, but as Descartes pointed out, the only reason that we have the concept of illusory perceptions is because we have the concept of perceptions that are accurate. If we didn't have that contrast, we, we wouldn't have that distinction. Okay? Well, subjective and objective, are there's such a distinction. True and false, what would it be for something to be true if we didn't know what it was for something to be false? Saying all truth is subjective is a way of saying essentially there is no distinction. If I believe it's true, that makes it true somehow. Magic wand. If there's no distinction between true and false, then we wouldn't have the concepts of true and false. If there's no distinction between subjective and objective, then we wouldn't have the concepts. The solipsist knows what he's saying. He's wrong. Well, okay, loss of mythology, what is that about? Why do people tend to embrace um, 
radical skepticism, at least at some points in history. Rene Descartes points out that when, uh, when medieval culture is collapsing, old ways of believing have failed, people fall into radical skepticism. They believed uncritically, and now they're going to doubt uncritically. First of all, I believed everything, now I'm not going to believe anything. Okay? Equally unskillful responses. Uh, Socrates pointed out, he said, you know, oftentimes when people just have no, uh, no regard for argument, for investigation, no time for philosophy at all, oftentimes what's happened is it's, a, it's, it's like being a misanthropist. A misanthropist is somebody who hates humanity in general. So people who are misanthropists generally started out thinking everyone's my friend. I trust everyone. I believe everyone. And they got burned so badly that now they've gone to the other extreme. I don't trust anybody. I don't believe anybody. Nobody's my friend. He said, people do that with belief, too. I believed all kinds of things too uncritically. I got burned. And now I won't believe anything. I thought I knew the truth. I got really disappointed. No, I'm not going to believe anything, no matter what the evidence, no matter what the arguments. Okay? Again, an equally unskillful response. The skillful response should be, I believe too uncritically. Rather than now start doubting too uncritically, I ought to ask, how do I form beliefs that will stand up to scrutiny? Okay. Loss of mythology, Jean-Paul Sartre refers to that sometimes in his novels. Loss of mythology occurs when the background beliefs that have given a narrative to your life, the beliefs of your culture, the beliefs of the institutions in which you live, have been destroyed by warfare, by cultural upheaval, by personal crisis or whatever, and you simply are like you're down at the bottom part of the divided line. You don't no, you don't have any idea how to understand what it is you're experiencing. Rather than start climbing toward the light, it's possible to turn toward the darkness and say, there is nothing but the shadows. I guess there's been nothing but the shadows all along. Sartre, particularly in his novel Troubled Sleep, talks about this and says, you know, the French soldiers who were prisoners of the Germans, it wasn't that they feared brutal treatment. It wasn't the, the humiliation of having lost. It was the complete loss of their mythology of what it meant to be French and therefore superior to everyone else in the world. And of course, Sartre is speaking as a Frenchman and one who was at one point a prisoner of the Germans. A week before having been defeated and captured by the Germans, we would have said the French soldiers are the best soldiers in the world. France is the navel of the universe. People who don't speak French owe us an apology. And if they try to speak French, they owe us another apology because they won't do it right. France, it's, it's the center of all things. And as a Frenchman, I am superior to all other beings. And here I am, totally powerless, totally humiliated. My whole mythology, my whole set of beliefs about who I am and where I am in the world has collapsed. At that point, it's very easy to fall into this uh, attitude of nothing's real, nothing's true. We can't know any truth because you've been so badly burned by beliefs that you held uncritically. Okay? Um, that, however, keeps you chained in the bottom of the cave rather than stepping out into the sun. If the radical skeptic were, true, were right, philosophy would be impossible. The fact that we have a common language, that we can understand each other, the fact that we can actually manipulate our environment, <laughs> the fact that we can actually engage with the world and with one another is all evidence against what the radical skeptic is claiming. Okay? As both Aristotle and Wittgenstein point out, if it were true, if what these people were saying were true, we couldn't know it to be true. They could never express it. So we can just end by repeating Aristotle's observation. If they say anything, I got them. <laughs>